you know, social media gets you out there and you become the instant celebrity or whatever you want to call it. But you also do have to make money. So you have to figure out the balance between the two. Welcome to the Networking with Michelle podcast, the show dedicated on providing you the how to's of marketing and networking strategies. Here we believe in the Jim Rohn quote, success is nothing more than a few simple disciplines practiced every day. Hey, good people. Welcome to the Networking with Michelle show. I'm your host, Michelle Gomez. So grateful to be here. Excited about this week. It's been a great week. I know it's hump day, but I'm telling you, you can push through. Uh, Just be grateful that you're able, able to work, able to run your business, able to drive, able to work out. Right. There's a lot of people. They're not able to do the things that we do. You know, so I believe gratitude carries you and it's all about perspective. And I appreciate you because there's hundreds of podcasts, thousands of podcasts. And um, you're taking a little bit of time to listen to me today. And I am humbled and I appreciate it. And um, I want to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So today's special guest is Judy Hoberman. Judy Hoberman, and um, she was actually brought to me by Carrie Heaps, um, Strictly Marketing. I had a chance to interview Carrie some time ago, and she sent me an email, and she was like, I have this great guest for you, and I was like, hey, why not? And um, Judy was able to come onto the show and blow me away, and she is known for her book, Selling in a Skirt. I love it. Selling in a Skirt. Uh, Women want to be treated equally, not identically. And um, she just has powerful words from her book titles and the little phrases and mantras that she has on her website. And what I love about this interview uh, is that we talk about um, how how men can be more accommodating to women and how women need to be encouraged and pushed through in their male-dominated industries. And when she talks about skirt, it's not about an article of clothing. Um, it's actually an acronym, and she gets into that. And when she was saying that to me, I was like, man, this is really about a way of life. It's really about your work ethic. It's about a mindset. Like, is this what you really want? And if it is, you know, how are you going to push through? And um, very similar to SMART goals. And um, just just blown away by the acronym SKIRT. And so if you're a guy listening to the show, don't be blown. Don't like, um, you know, I don't, I'm not a woman. This book's not for me. There's something for you in this interview. There's something for you in that book. Or right? even if you're a leader or you're a manager, she's the person that you need to reach out to if you want to create that culture that is a safe place for women, um, that women cannot just come in to a job, but they have the ability to create a career. Um, within your office. Uh, We also talk about, you know, do sales lead to wealth and the difference between wealth and famous? Um, uh, What are the qualities of a good salesperson? Uh, We also talk about um, time management. That's something I'm struggling in right now. It's like, man, there's not enough hours in the day. And she gave the number one tip for time management. So this is a great episode. I know you're going to enjoy it. I also want to let you know this episode is brought to you by Line 25 Consulting, where we help entrepreneurs create content that connects with their audience, utilizing digital platforms. And Line 25, um, hey, I'll say it, it's my company, um, uh, the new service Pod Connect. Uh, we've been getting a lot of great feedback from that. A lot of great feedback. So if you're an author, expert, entrepreneur, you got a new book, product or service that's coming out, and you're like, and you're like, how can I get on the podcast? How can I uh, jump on these podcasts and promote my stuff? PodConnect helps you with that. We'll take your expertise. We'll match you with the right podcast in order for you to get interviews. All right, so check us out, line25consulting.com. That's line number 25consulting.com. For more information. I look forward to hearing from you. Hey, without further ado, Judy Hoberman. Hey everyone, today's special guest is Judy Hoberman. She is a selling guru. She is the um, author of Selling in a Skirt. Judy, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm great, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. Super excited to be here. Absolutely. So first of all, I love your website. You have all of these cute phrases and slogans that I want to get into. Um, First of all, how did you get into sales? 
Oh my God. I've been in sales since uh, Girl Scout cookies. And it was, bef- it was before you were allowed to have your parents sell for you. And it was before you were allowed to go to a supermarket. I mean, you actually had to sell cookies. And I was always number one because I wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to have my name up on a plaque that said I was number one. So that's how it started, <laughs> you know, all the way back then. So it was in your DNA. Okay. I, I do believe that was probably the case and still is. <laughs> So how did you come up with this clever phrase, selling in a skirt? You know, I have always been in male-dominated industries. I've been in construction and uh, security systems and insurance. And, And when I decided to start my company, I was trying to figure out, like, who am I and who do I want to attract? So it was sales. And I was a female. I am a female. And so selling in a skirt made, you know, you could actually picture a woman selling. Um, the, here's the drawback. Most of the men that actually need to hear some of the things that I talk about, because I talk about differences, um, they always say to me, I don't wear a skirt. And I, yeah, okay, you don't have to wear a skirt. It's really not about the article of clothing, but that's okay. You know, so sometimes you have to be careful what you put out there. And the other part is everybody always expects me to be wearing a skirt. So I always wear a skirt. Yeah. Okay. And what does skirt mean exactly? Okay, so it's actually an acronym, and it means um, standing out, because if you think about this incredibly noisy world that we live in, um, we have to figure out how do you stand out. You know, I work a lot with insurance professionals, and they always say, well, we're all competitors, but you're not, because everybody has a different market that you're targeting. So how do you stand out? That's the S. The K is keys to success. What do you have in your toolbox that makes you successful, and how can we even make that more successful for you? The I is inspiration. Everybody needs to be inspired and or they want to inspire others. So, you know, where are your core values and how do they line up with your um, goals? The R obviously is results because no matter where you are in sales, everybody looks at results, whether it's people, whether it's numbers, whether it's dollars, doesn't matter. And then the T is the big one, time management. No matter who you are, no matter what gender, no matter what age, no matter what anything, we all struggle with time management. So that's my skirt. Definitely. I I don't think I've done well in traditional sales, like the outside sales, but I come from a financial background and I was better when it came to inside sales. Okay. Um, however, what, what are the good qualities of a good salesperson? Oh, you have to be able to ask questions and you have to be able to listen. That's it. There's your secret. There's the big secret about sales. And everybody says, oh my God, sales is so hard. It isn't. Ask questions and listen. Because when I ask you enough questions, you're going to give me not only what you want and when you want it, you're going to tell me why you want it. And so when you get the why, that's the secret of sales. Why? And then when I'm listening to you and I can repeat it back to you, the greatest compliment a salesperson can ever get is, oh my gosh, you really listened to me. That's it. So there's your secret about sales, whether you're inside, outside, doesn't matter. And everybody's in sales, even if they don't actually sell a product or a service. You know, you think about a CEO of a company, he's in sales or she's in sales. You think about um, any executive, he's in sales, she's in sales. It, it's it, it all, everybody's in sales. So when you ask enough questions and you listen, there you go. Do you, so do you think, sales is a skill like you practice and develop it over time? Um, I think that the best salespeople actually do that. And I think that's a really good thing to do because a lot of us get very lazy. When you start to do well, you think, oh my gosh, I've arrived. I don't really have to do too much because I'm really awesome. And that's great. And it's wonderful to be confident, but you have to practice like anything else. Do you think that, you know, any athlete, wins a game or wins a match or whatever, and then doesn't do it anymore? No. So we, you have to practice your skill. And, and part of it is understanding your, you know, what it is you're selling. So whether it's a product or a service, do you know how it works? Do you know who it works for? Do you know what happens if you have it? And do you know what happens if you don't have it? So yeah, I believe that you have to practice it. Now with, I consider myself an older millennial. Um, so I feel like I still do my best to manage that hybrid of traditional and online sales. And now, you know, the talk is, you know, the sales funnel, you got to get people in your sales funnel, email them, nurture their relationship, all that kind of stuff. But I mean, it's a good old fashioned cold call and door knocking (laughs) office visit still relevant. 
Yeah, you know, I, I think that we go back and forth a little bit. You know, a couple of years ago, maybe even closer to like five to 10 years ago, people stopped using a phone, just totally stopped using it. Everything was an email or a text and, and nobody bothered with the phone. The phone's coming back in again because people are starting to pick up that phone. So yeah, there are things that, that we were used to, that we got away from, and then we come back to it. You have to go back to the basics. And, and a lot of times you think about the way sales have always been done. Well, that's great, but there's new ways of doing sales. And as a millennial, you have different ways that you like to be communicated with. And as a boomer, which I am, I have different ways. I, I do not like getting a text from somebody that I don't know. If I know you, I absolutely will text with you. But if I don't know you, I don't want to text with you. And it's the same way a lot of millennials will say to me, well, I don't want to talk to people if I don't know them. I get it. I do get it. And so we learn from each other. And if we don't learn from each other, then what's the point anyway? That's true. I, I do think that we are starting to long for that relationship again. Uh -huh. um, and then kind of like, well, you know, if this, if you're my guy, if you're my attorney, you know, I don't care what firm you work for, wherever you go, I go. Uh, so I think we're longing for that relationship and that loyalty again, um, personally, as well as professionally. Absolutely. It's all about relationships. And you think about this, you know, a lot of millennials are not afraid to jump ship. If you're working for a company, and, and this is not for entrepreneurs necessarily, but if you work for a company and you're not happy or you don't like their core values or you don't like their social cause or whatever else, you're going to change. You're going to, you're going to jump. And so a lot of times um, people will say, well, millennials don't hold down a job. Well, no, their priorities are a little bit different, but what doesn't change is the relationship. Okay, so so let's say you worked for a company and they invested in you to, you know, with a great mentoring program or whatever. You're more likely to stay with them because you've built a relationship. And so even if you're not really crazy about their social cause or you're not crazy about anything, if it's something that you can live with, you might stay longer. OK, and then you think about the other side. What if you were looking for a job or what if you were looking to build your business? These relationships that you've built through the years, no matter if you're a millennial or a boomer or any of the different generations, um, the relationships will carry you through to that next that next career or that next opportunity or whatever. So relationships are huge in sales. Huge. Definitely. Um, I'm glad you brought up mentorship. Uh, do you, and I believe you can have more than one mentor, um, uh -huh. but I think we do kind of gravitate more to what we're comfortable or what looks like us. Um, since you've been working in male dominated industries, were you able to find good women mentors or did you have predominantly men mentors um, throughout your career? I had not, I've never had a female mentor. Mm. There were no women. You know, like sometimes sometimes people say, well, you know, women don't like each other. It has nothing to do with it because there were no women. So I had amazing men that were my mentors. However, because they are not exactly like you, you they can take you to a certain level and then you have to figure out the rest yourself. But here's the truth about mentoring, whether it's an official program or an unofficial program. Mentoring truly only means it's two people that want to spend time together and share information. That's it. That's all it means. So if you're being mentored by someone and you don't feel it, you need to change it. And the reason you need to change it is because you're not going to get anything out of it and neither are they. And so some people stay in mentoring programs because they're put in it and, you know, and you don't want to whine and complain. But honestly, mentoring is a, an amazing opportunity for people. So take advantage of it. But if it's not right, you don't need another thing that's not working. Uh, one thing you say is that women want to be treated equally, not identical identically. Where did that come from? That, that's my saying. I, I, I live, <laughs> I live by that. And there, you know, all it really means is we want the same opportunities. We don't want to be men and you don't want us to be men. And the, the problem is that, you know, many years ago, women were trying to take the role on of being, you know, the, all the male qualities and attributes. And it's very confusing to everyone, including yourself. So you, we just want the same opportunities. We want to be treated the same way, you know, equally, 
but we don't want to be treated as a man. You give us the same opportunities and let us work as women. And I'm not saying that, you know, you want an opportunity and then you want the flowers on the desk and you want drapes on your windows. That's not what I'm saying. But if there's an opportunity for somebody to advance, why isn't it the right candidate? Why does it have to be just a man? That's that's what equal, not identical means. Yeah. So what's your advice to, I guess, men and women, but first um, for men to be more accommodating to women in these male dominated industries and then the advice for that woman to push through in the male dominated industry? Well, you know, honestly speaking, it's all about communication. And if men, like a lot of companies will hire me to help them recruit women into their industries. And I always say to them, why? Why do you want women in the industries? Now, if they give me a good reason, then it's okay. But if they say to me, oh, it's the buzzword. We just want, want, to, want to have women because we need the quota. Then I don't help. I can't. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. But when they say to me, you know, we really try, we believe women should have the same opportunities and we really b- believe women bring some great things to the table, then I can help them. The other part of that is, what happens when the women are in there? Are you going to help mentor them? Are they going to have opportunities? So I think it's all about the communication portion of it. And as women, we also have to understand that men and women communicate differently. A lot of times people think, well, two women can communicate, but it's not always the case. It isn't. But we have to understand that generally speaking, big generalization here, Michelle, big, women are relational, men are transactional. Okay, there are women that are very transactional. There are men that are very relational. But in generally speaking, that's what happens. So when you do come into a company that is very heavily male dominated and they ask you a question, they're usually asking you a close ended question. The yes, the no, the maybe so they don't want to hear a story. They want bullet points. Right. So if you understand that, that'll be great because that's your job right now. As the male, whether it's a manager, a supervisor, a peer, when they ask you a question, when, you know, if I'm a man and I'm asking you a question and you want to tell me a story, I may not want to hear the whole story, but I have to be able to also listen to what you're saying, because that's where good communication comes in. When you're in sales, you know, and this happened to me plenty of times, my male manager would say, did you make the sale? So the answer is only yes or no. There is nothing else. But I always had a reason. You know, so I would say, if I would say no, he would, you know, he would stop me and go, why didn't you make the sale? Blah, 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 blah. But he didn't let me say, I'm coming back on Tuesday to pick up a check. He didn't give me that opportunity. So so that's, that's where we miss the boat a lot of times. Yeah, you're right. Communication is important. And I like your angle on it because, I mean, if a company is saying, oh, we need more women, you know, I would. It's, I feel like it's a catch 22 because I feel like I kind of been here before because you have that moment. If I'm a new grad and you have this company and they're really pushing, I guess, the entry of women and I'm excited because I have this new job and this opportunity and I get there, but then I don't see that career ladder. I don't see that upward ah. mobility because once again, it's a male dominated industry and they, the company hasn't taken that time to think that far ahead on not just getting women in here, but how can we create a culture that supports women as well as career growth? And and that is, that's the hard part. And that's what I'm saying. You know, a lot of times companies will say that's what they want, but in reality, they won't. There was a company that asked me to help them recruit women. And I said to them, why? And they said, well, you know, we should have women on our team. We have no women. And, you know, and that's the way of the world right now, blah, blah, blah. So it wasn't as obnoxious as it could have been, but it was pretty close. So I said to them, what are you going to do when you have them here? Do you have a way to mentor them? Do you have a way to give them advancement? And he went, no. So I said, so what are you going to do? He said, if it doesn't work, we'll get more. See, <laughs> so guess what I did? I said, thank you so much. I don't believe I'm the right person. I commend you on that. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. But that's what happens. And and that's what I'm saying. That's what happens. And so you have to be, a, you know, able to either speak up for yourself or you have to have somebody that's your advocate. 
I listen, or I used to listen to a lot of Grant Cardone. I'm not sure if mm-hmm. you follow him. Yeah, 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 yeah I do. Mm-hmm. Over the top, very aggressive. Yeah. And um, his belief is, you know, sales leads to wealth. Whether, you know, you're selling cars like he did or you're an entrepreneur. Uh, what's your take on that? I do believe that sales can lead to wealth, but I also believe you have to be in it for the right reason. If you come into sales strictly for the money, it, you'll never, you know, n- nine times out of 10, you won't be successful. If you come into sales for the right reason, where you're going to help somebody or you're going to help them grow or whatever it is, the byproduct is the money. That's the way I've always done it. So when I was in insurance and I was in insurance for a very long time, you know, if somebody said to me, why are you in insurance? My answer always was and always will be, I help protect families. That's what I wanted to do. Oh, and by the way, my byproduct was the commission that I made. I didn't say, I, I, you know, insurance, uh, you know, you can make a lot of money in insurance. Oh, yeah. And by the way, you're protecting people. It's backwards. It's backwards. It's the same way when, when, I, when I was, you know, an agency manager, um, anybody that wanted to get promoted to be a sales leader, I would ask them for the top three reasons why they wanted to be promoted. And if any of them was about money or leveraging their time with other people, I did not promote them. Because I felt that they were in it for the wrong reason. If they said to me, oh, you know, I really get this and I want to help other people be successful, that that's what you look for in a leader. So, um, so it's the same thing. If you go into sales strictly for the money, it, it doesn't work. And most women, are uh, money's not number one. Money is in the column, you know, the top five or six, but it's recognition and it's bringing value and it's making a difference. And, you know, it's those kind of things that women bring to the table not saying men don't, but most of the time what women do, well, I don't want anybody to ever say that I was, you know, I'm not, uh, that I'm a male bash or anything. I'm not. I am an equal opportunity lover. And I just want to understand that, that it's differences that we have, not right, wrong, better, worse. It's strictly differences. If we can figure out the differences and work together, can you just imagine how much more uh, appealing it would be for women to come into different businesses? Yes. With the influx of social media and the use of video, do you think more people are concerned about being famous versus wealth? Um, that you know that that being famous does not necessarily mean that you're doing anything either. I mean, I wrote a book called "Famous Isn't Enough." So I mean, everybody knew my name at some point, but I was making zero money doing it. You know, yeah. So, you know, social media gets you out there and you become the instant celebrity or whatever you want to call it. But you also do have to make money. So you have to figure out the balance between the two. So that's what I'm saying. So whatever your position is, whatever your business is, why do you do it? You have to remember your why. That's it. Just remember your why and that will carry you through. Your why is going to bring you money if you do it the right way, if your why is strong enough. Yeah, I, it's so interesting to me because I feel like a lot of people feel, I'll just say, social media famous. Uh, like once they become famous, they then they'll monetize, right? Mm-hmm. Versus, you know, finding their why, their purpose, and finding honest ways to create money out of that. Um, I guess before the fame arises and it's an ongoing debate that I'm always having with people. So I love the title of your book, Famous Isn't Enough, Earning Mm -hmm. Your Fortune as an Entrepreneur. So I definitely want to check that out. And that really was about all the mistakes that I made. That's what it was. It was every mistake I made and I made plenty. I made so many mistakes that I even made some up that they, that's how bad it was. And yeah. And so I, if I could save somebody some time or some money or anything like that, that would be okay. Cause that's what it was all about. You know, as a, as an entrepreneur and there's lots of entrepreneurs out there, if you're a solopreneur where it's just you, there's no one else on your team. Why would you have to write out your goals? I know what my goals were. I, they were in my head. Why would I have to write them out? Because you have no place to measure them. You know, that was one of my biggest aha moments was, oh, I really do need to do this. You know, so that's what it was all about. Now, you mentioned time management earlier, and it was, I think it was this weekend. I posted on Facebook and I was venting. I was like, I think I've gone to the point that I cannot manage my time any better I've come to the conclusion things are just not going to get done. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> I 
because I feel like I've tried everything, um, the different techniques, you know, books, apps, everything. But I got to ask you, <laughs> what are some time management techniques that you provide to your to your audience? I would say one of the biggest ones is getting control of your calendar. You have to, you know, you have to decide what it is you're going to do and for how long you're going to do it. And what are you forgetting to do? So for instance, you know, as an entrepreneur, as an insurance person, as anybody that has to get their name out there, one of the big things that people forget is marketing. So I'll I'll do it later. I'll do it tonight. When I get a chance, I'm going to do it. Well, guess what happens? You don't do it. And so I always tell you, get strict with your calendar, get it on your calendar. If, you know, when, when I was on the road a lot, um, I was a single mom. So guess what went on my calendar first? My children's games, because the only thing that they really wanted me to do was be at their games. I never missed a game because my schedule was around their schedule. I also never missed a training in, you know, in insurance because I knew when the trainings were, put it on my calendar. And when you do that, you look at your calendar, you see not only when you can't work, you know, when you you can't be on the road, you see when you can. Because if I knew that I had to take my children to school and then there was, you know, orthodontist and there was a game and there was this or that, that was not a game. That was not a day for me to be on the road, but it was certainly a day I could be on the phone. Okay. And so the next day when I had a seven hour break between dropping them off and picking them up, that was the day I was on the road. So, you know, I mean, you just have to take control over it. Now, on your calendar, did you put your to-do list on your calendar? Because I think that's what's hurting me. Mm -mm. I had my to-do list in front of me always. And and again, okay, so you're a millennial and I'm a, you know, and I'm a boomer. And yes, I do have a calendar on my phone and on my computer, but I also have a real calendar on my desk. So I, you know, I have always told my clients, here's what you need to do. Get yourself a blotter size calendar, big, big calendar and put your stuff on it. So when you sit at your desk, you can see what you're supposed to be doing and when you're supposed to be doing it. And so you can't, you, you know, you don't escape from your to-do list or your calendar. You don't because it's right there. Not, you don't have to open your phone up. You don't have to open your calendar, your computer up. It's right there. It's right there. Can't get away from it. Oh, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> All right, Judy. So, I mean, you, you've accomplished a lot. I mean, you're a keynote speaker. You've written several books, um, coaching, consulting, What's next? What's next for you, um, whether it's in the next six months or beyond that? Well, I have another book coming out, and um, it's all about women in leadership. And it's, you know, it's different than my other books because it's not about the differences between men and women. This is strictly for women. And um, there's a very big goal attached to it because I want to donate a good portion of the proceeds back to companies that truly believe in women in leadership. So that whole thing is being done as we speak. We're working on it to make sure that the the message gets out the right way. So keep keep watching. It'll be coming out shortly. Very impressive. Um, what do you want your legacy to be? My legacy? Uh, I just want to make sure that what I've done to, um, and, and I hate to use the word empower because everybody uses it, but truly to empower women and to make sure they understand how amazing they really are. I want that message to continue and I want little girls to understand that they too should be treated equally, not identically. And they too have more opportunities than we had. So that's my legacy. Okay. How can everyone get in touch with you? So everything is about selling in a skirt. So it's Judy at selling in a skirt.com is my email. My Facebook is selling in a skirt. Instagram is selling in a skirt. Um, Twitter is selling in a skirt. LinkedIn is Judy Hoberman. For some reason, you can't do selling in a skirt, but you know, that's the way it goes. But everything is really, I try to make it as easy as possible. Definitely. And my final question, um, you've been in sales. You've come across a lot of people. Uh, you've been all over the world speaking. What has been the biggest ask in your career? That someone's asked me or that I've asked them? That you've asked them. I think the biggest ask I've ever had to do was ask someone for help. Mm, humbling. And I don't, yeah. And I don't mean financially. I mean emotionally and, uh, you know, professionally that I just needed 
somebody else to guide me. And so I, I've always had a business coach. Um, it's an investment in me for myself and in my business. And um, I always tell people, you can't do this by yourself. You can't. It's too hard. And if you ask your spouse, it's great. Or your, you know, your partner, it's wonderful. But it's not just about that. You need somebody that's totally objective. Your spouse is going to love you no matter what, no matter how good or bad or whatever you feel. But, you know, you just need somebody else. And so I truly believe that you have to make an investment in yourself. And women don't necessarily want to do that. Why do you think that is? Because we always take the leftover crumbs. Okay, think about your family. You feed them first. And and we we take whatever's left over. And then even then we don't even take it. Oh yeah, I'll just, you know, yeah, yeah, you want another bite here, honey. You take another bite. Right? You know, that's that's the hard part. We just we don't we don't value ourselves as much as we should. And you know, there'll be people that'll listen to this and go, that's not true, that's not true. But in reality, it is true. Because you don't want to take money from your family and use it on yourself. You just you just don't. That's what women tend to not do. And, and, you know, and, and hopefully we're changing that a little. Uh, I love your honesty. I love it. I love it. No, yeah, that's me. Yeah, this is what you get. Like it or not. I can't help it. This is who I am. I always say, you know, you either like me or you won't. There's no gray area with me. You, it's very black and white here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, everyone. I want to thank you for listening to this episode with Judy Hoberman, sellinginaskirt.com. Be sure to check her out. As always, I believe in you. A personal connection leads to an influential network. So thanks for networking with Michelle.